The next game we will see is a very famous game that Bobby Fischer played on his way on becoming a world champion. Right before his match with Boris Spassky in 1972, he had to first defeat former world champion Tigran Petrosyan. And the following game we will see is one of those games from that match in 1971. This game is considered as one of the evergreens of positional chess, of how to play against an isolated weak pawn. Okay, this is game number seven from the match. Bobby Fischer started as usual with e4, c5, knight f3, e6. This is the Sicilian defense, d4, pawn takes, knight takes, and a6. This is the Paulsen variation of the Sicilian. Bishop d3, and knight c6. Here white has a choice to stay in the center with the knight or capture, but they usually do capture in this position. Pawn takes back and white castles just following the general opening principles, putting the king into safety. Now black is delaying it somewhat and wants to have a strong center position and played d5. But white doesn't let him be so comfortable in the center and right away played c4, trying to break that nice setup in black's center. Now if black just pushes the pawn to d4, the plan was to play e5 and then later bring the knight through d2 to e4. If black captures either pawn, white just recaptures with the bishop and the pawn on c6 will be a target on a half open file. Black played knight f6, continuing to develop and to put more defense on the d5 pawn. And now came the trade on d5, pawn took back with the c pawn, e pawn took on d5, and black took back with the pawn. Why not knight d5 that does not isolate the pawn on the d5? In that case, the plan was simply to play bishop e4, put a pin on the knight, and let's say after bishop e7, knight c3, using the pin, bishop b7, queen a4 check. And now black is in a little bit of trouble, either moves the king and gives up the right to castle, or if black blocks, then white trades queens and makes a, a pin another time with rook d1. And black is in trouble. Let's see what happens if black plays rook a7, getting out of the pin instead of developing the bishop right away. In that case, the plan would be to play Queen d4 attacking the rook, rook d7, and to play knight c3. Also with an advantage because black has trouble developing the dark squared bishop that is busy protecting the pawn on g7 for now. Let's go back to the game where black took back on d5 with the pawn. On his next move, Bobby Fischer spent more than 20 minutes and played knight to c3. It's kind of surprising because it's a very obvious looking move, but I'm sure he was calculating the upcoming variations. Petrosian developed his bishop, which is a very natural move. In case the other bishop develops, White's plan is to play queen a4 check, and after knight d7, to play queen c6, attacking the pawn on d5, and when it gets pushed, the knight goes to e2, attacking the pawn again, and after bishop c5, knight f4, and the bishop on e6 is in trouble. Let's set the position back again. Let's see what happened in the game after the bishop went to e7. This is a critical moment 
where white has to do the right thing. The queen moved to a4 check. The idea is to provoke the black bishop to move to d7 that will block the queen's protection to the d5 pawn and then the plan was either to move the queen back simply to c2 or maybe to d4 blocking the pawn. And here Patricia made a mistake, blocked the check with the queen. This is an interesting moment in the game because white has an opportunity to win an exchange. Next move. However, Bobby Fischer understands chess even deeper than that and he chose rather a long-term positional advantage than to give counterplay to his opponent. The move that could have won an exchange was bishop to b5, making a pin on the black queen and using another pin. But then the following would happen. Pawn takes bishop, queen takes rook, white won an exchange, black castles. Now the white queen better hurries up and comes back, but black gets some counterplay by playing d4, and now let's say if knight takes b5, bishop to b7, and combining the threats with the d-pawn, as well as getting the queen and the knight to attack on the king's side, black has some counterplay. It's debatable whether enough counterplay, but Bobby didn't even want to give that much counter chances to his opponent. Let's go back to the position where Bobby decided not to win the exchange, but play the positional rook e1, not letting his opponent to castle. Now, if black would try to castle, black would lose a piece after the queen's being traded, and then the bishop on e7 remains unprotected, and the rook can capture it. Petrosian decided to trade queens on a4. Of course, white would take back, and black still has difficulties castling. Therefore, played bishop to e6. And white proceeds developing bishop to e3 and black castle. Now it's interesting to look at this position, how to actually win. We see that yes, black has two isolated pawns, but how to actually win them or, or win the game? Well, the first step is trying to trade the dark squared bishops. So the pawn on d5 could be blocked better. That's why Bobby played bishop to c5, forcing the trade of the bishops. The bishop cannot run away because then the black rook would be hanging. Black protected the bishop and Bobby captured and the rook captured back. And now another good move for white, b4, starting to advance the pawns on the queen's side. The idea is if black plays a5, White wants to be sure to be able to push through the pawn and have a passed pawn on the b5. Black played in this position king f8. Following the principle in the endgame, bring your king closer to the center. Knight c5, attacking the pawn on a6. And the bishop went back to protect it by bishop c8. And now the next plan is to get the king, the white king, also involved in the game. White played f3 with the purpose to opening the road for the white king, also to control two crucial squares, especially the e4 square, take it away from black, from any possible knight e4 jumps. Here black played a little bit passive move, rook e to a7. According to analysts, it was a little bit better probably to trade the rooks instead. Now came rook to e5, tying down black's knight, keeping it busy to protect the pawn on d4. Black played bishop d7. And this is a moment that Garry Kasparov really admired, because white made here a very unorthodox decision. Normally speaking, we are happy to trade a knight for a bishop. However, here it's obvious that the knight on c5 looks better than the bishop on d7. 
The knight has an outpost that can hardly be kicked out from. It's attacking the pawn on a6. It blocks, blocks rook's involvement in the game along the c file. And yet, he understood deep enough that still, this advantage could be transformed to a different advantage that's even bigger than having this beautiful knight on c5. Knight took on d7. Only the rook can take back because the knight is busy still protecting the pawn. And now white gains control of the other open file as well by playing rook c1. The idea is to come to c6. Also, we have a more direct tactical threat by simply picking the pawn up because of black's back rank problem. If rook would take, then rook comes down and checkmate the following move. That explains black's next move, which was rook to d6. That prevents both of them protecting the a6 pawn with the other rook and doesn't let the white rook get to c6 either. However, protected one thing, but lets another thing loose, the rook can get to the seventh rank, which is just as dangerous. Now the threat is to come in with the second rook also. That would be really, really devastating for black. The knight went to d7, attacking the rook, and the rook now cannot go to e7, but had to retreat to e2. Black played g6, trying to get the king out there, maybe. And time to get the king involved. King f2. Now, black has no active plans. Black has to kind of wait. Played h5. And now white made another fine move. If white would simply continue moving the king up to the center, that would allow knight e5. So first, 